Many Fortune 500 companies are promising to reduce or eliminate carbon emissions by mid-century. Luke Oliver, Managing Director Climate at Crane Shares, is going to explain the carbon markets that will help companies make the transition. Luke, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I want to get into the crane share business in a moment because it's really quite interesting. But maybe first you can overview us on the carbon markets. What are they? Uh, why were they set up? Yeah, well, there's two types of carbon market, and I'm going to mainly focus on the big one. The small one is the offset market where people are growing trees, doing industrial projects to create carbon offsets. We're going to park that for a moment. That's about $2 billion of business a year, so definitely the smaller end of the wedge. The big end of the wedge is the $800 billion futures market that trades in compliance carbon. And what compliance carbon is, is regulatory permits. So it, it sounds somewhat niche, but as I mentioned, it's a, it's a uh, you know, getting towards a trillion dollars in trading every year. And what it, what it is, is various economies. So the European Union, it could be uh, the state of California, which is paired up with Canada. It could be the northeast of the US from Virginia up to Maine. And also the UK has a program. Um, those those are covered by by crane shares. There's also an Australian, a New Zealand, a China, uh, a, a South Korea. There are programs eventually covering the, the whole globe. But what they do is they set a cap on the amount of carbon that they will allow to be polluted each year and auction those offsets or those credits, should I say. So those carbon allowances, think of them as permits, get auctioned to companies and then they trade. And so companies that own them seek to reduce their emissions so they can then sell those credits or avoid buying them in the first place. So by putting a price on carbon, you've suddenly internalized what used to be an external cost. So society and the, the, um, you know, the ecosystem bore the cost of pollution. The companies didn't. We're now putting that cost into the companies. And that is creating this incentive for companies to decarbonize. And when I say that, I usually split the room. Half of the room say, wow, that's amazing. Um, I want to be involved in that. With, with, that sounds like the most powerful way to reduce pollution and, and solve climate change. The other half of the room say, oh, my God, goodness, you're, you're, you're taxing companies. This is bad for business. This is, gonna, this is a war on energy. This is a war on agriculture. It's not that. By putting a price on carbon, you're simply giving these companies and the, 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 the world's engineers a new opportunity to optimize for a new input. And so this is going to create a huge capital cycle, but 140 trillion is the estimate over the next 20 to 30 years to decarbonize the global economy. So this is great uh, from an economic standpoint, and it is also great for the environment. So this is re the really is the perfect marriage of regulation. So putting a cap and a price on carbon, but also capital markets and, and capitalism, which is allowing the, the, the cream to rise. Companies can take action and avert these costs if they find greener solutions. And those green solutions are going to create great value for those, those companies. So carbon markets is almost a blend of stick and carrot that is going to be the most powerful tool. And of course, you can invest in that carbon market as well, which is where, uh, where Crane Shares has taken its position. Uh, so I'm a company that is buying a uh, carbon offset. Is that correct, Luke? And then I'm buying it on this particular market. But to who is buying that on the other side and who is actually, what service is being provided there? Well, that's it. So, so on the offset side, the, that is the, that smaller side, there is, a, there is an activity that creates a negative carbon, if you like, and yeah. they then sell that to a company that's polluting. We're not that that's that's where there's that's a smaller a, market that you're talking about that's, before. That's the smaller yep. market. And that's where there's this kind of notion that one person is positive, one is negative, and they, they find a price to meet in, the, meet in the middle. Very interesting market. But the real story here is the compliance market. And so the two sides of that trade is, you know, let's use the European Union. The European Union auctions these allowances. And so you get this this situation where the government is saying you need one of these allowances if you're going to pollute. The value of that allowance would will equate with the value of the business that you can do that creates that pollution. So if you're a steel manufacturer, for every ton of steel you create, there's an amount of carbon dioxide that you put into the atmosphere because you burn coal to create the steel from the iron ore. And so you need to buy those those permits. So there's no um, sort of offsetting activity. It's that there is a, a revenue is generated by the European Union auctioning these. So it's a little bit like taxation, but what, it, what that, what that uh, war chest 
that is created by auctioning those allowances, that is put towards green initiatives. Um, you know, like take for example, right now, um, a lot of European companies are trying to get away from dependence on Russian gas because of this, the situation in Ukraine. That is being funded. That is being, there are grants that are coming from this money that's been raised by the carbon markets. So carbon markets have three types of impact. One, by auctioning them, you're raising revenue that can go towards all of these initiatives. Two, you create fuel switching, which means if you're burning coal and coal is dirtier fuel than gas, you might find that now with the price of carbon allowances coming into play, you should just switch to natural gas. And so by switching from coal to gas, you've saved yourself money, you've avoided buying as many carbon allowances, you've also halved the pollution that you're putting into the atmosphere. And so that's the basic mechanics of how putting a price on carbon immediately starts reducing emissions. And then the third, which is the most exciting in my opinion, is by putting a price on carbon that's rising, not only as investors are we long this rising asset, but you're starting to create all this innovation because companies, not just the companies that are polluting, but independent companies, entrepreneurs are coming to market and saying, well, if there's a price of say 100 tons, $100 per ton of carbon, well, I can create, there's, there's, there, are, there are efficiencies I can create in industrial processes that will reduce carbon emissions. And that, that, didn't, that used to be a completely worthless invention. Now there's a price on carbon that has a value and you start to get investors and companies want to buy that, that innovation. So we've got this huge arms race of innovation that's happening in every industry across the globe, whether that's agriculture, whether that's aviation, whether that's steel, whether that's glass, cement, you name it. There is this incredible opportunity that is created by this rising price of carbon. So three, three real impact, the auction revenue, the fuel switching, and then the innovation that, that comes from that. So I think we're on track finally to putting a dent in the climate problem while also creating economic, um, strong economic outcomes for investors. And I believe that that's where it really happens. I think it's very difficult to rely on investors being nice to fund important projects. You need to make it worth their while. And this is the, the like I said, the perfect marriage of, of, of uh, regulation and capital markets coming together to do something really powerful and drive good returns. Talk about the carbon market's uh, recent performance. Um, I, I believe that it has been performing strongly. Uh, also, um, what are some of the factors that might drive the market? Um, in another interview, you said, for instance, the weather might be one factor. Weather, weather's a factor. Uh, the energy mix of the economy that the market operates in is a factor. The political will of that of that uh, economy. So you can imagine, you know, the northeast of the US with a mixture of red and blue states might have a very different political outlook than California as a state versus Europe, even even more uh, towards the other end of uh, end of the spectrum. Um, the, the the so we mentioned the weather, not just the weather as it changes, but the, the, the you know, the climate in, you know, is it, you know, hotter countries are going to burn more electricity during the summer and AC colder countries are going to spend more use more electricity in the winter on um, on on warming. And so you have all these factors. But what's really driving these markets is the the policy, the policy to reduce the amount of allowances to reduce the amount of pollution that can occur. But the transmission for that is people are polluting. You're now giving a finite number of allowances and reducing that. So that's going to create the price moving higher. And it's that rising price which forces those companies to, to, to change. So in terms of recent performance, we had a very bumpy year, like a lot of asset classes with the invasion of, of, of Ukraine meant that we had sky high natural gas prices. And what that threatened was recession, but potentially demand destruction. Certain industries just could not afford to operate with those prices of natural gas. So pollution dropped. So we saw the, the, the carbon allowances drop also. However, we saw a lot of switching from natural gas, which was running out because Russia wasn't supplying it, back to burning coal, which meant more pollution. So carbon credits went back up. So we, we, we've had this tumultuous year. What's great about the, the policy making, especially in Europe, is we've proven something. People were concerned that under stress, under recession, under energy crisis, these programs would not be politically supported. We saw the opposite. Europe doubled down. They said, despite what's happening in, in, um, in Russia, we actually need these programs more than ever because it's the auction revenue that we need to fund the, uh, the independence, We're shifting away from, from Russian dependency to European uh, energy independence. So it has been 
incredible to see Europe strengthen its program right about the time where people were worried that we would see if there were cracks in this program. So we're very bullish going into 2023 because the policy has now been laid out. Europe plans to raise additional money for uh, Repower EU, which is the, the program of you know energy security that, that I've just been talking about. And they're going to fund it from the program, but they're not going to increase supply. They're going to net keep it flat. They're going to auction more allowances in the next three years and then fewer in the three years after that. So we're, where the market was pricing in some concern, we've actually come in a little better and now we've got a steeper tightening curve coming out. So to, to use an analogy of where we think this market is going, whether it's this year or for the next 10 years, think of like a, a Fed tightening cycle. They are tightening or easing, whichever way you want to look at it. Don't fight the Fed is, is, is the refrain. The carbon market is going to be tightened from here out. And that is going to result in a increasing price if you believe that emissions will not fall as quickly as the cap on these allowances. So it's a really unique market that it's somewhat asymmetric. It's designed to force change through rising prices. And we're able to actually be along that market and be part of that price discovery. We think the price should be much higher. Therefore, um, we're along that market and we're not we're not the only ones that think that. Uh, Luke, uh, despite uh, that uh, market being bumpy, I mean, uh, you've grown crane shares uh, exposure to that market to, to quite a size uh, since I guess uh, the inception of the fund um, helped me out again, I think, uh, at, at yep. the start of the decade. Uh, maybe talk about, uh, you know, uh, what is a fund that uh, crane shares has there? How does, you know, what is it piece of that market and uh, how's it performing? Yeah, so it's so KRBN is our global product. We're about two and a half years in this market. And as you said, the market is about 10 years. So it's a little bit longer in, in Europe, but about 10 years where we've had these these sort of three vibrant markets in the UK launch just last year. Uh, oh, sorry, 2021 was when uh, the UK launched. So we have a portfolio, the global portfolio KRBN holds about 60% Europe, 5% UK, 30% California, and 5% northeast of the US, Reggie. And you might wonder why California is so much bigger than Reggie. Reggie is just the uh, power industry, whereas the California program is the entire economy, which is uh, more analogous with, with Europe. So um, we have this really nice blend of all of these, these markets, all at different levels, all at different levels of maturity, do not correlate with each other, which is incredible. And the basket itself doesn't correlate. We've maintained about a 0.3 correlation um, since you know records on these these prices go back to 2014, correlation to U.S. equities is about 0.3, about 0.3 to commodities as well. So an incredible diversifier. When it comes to performance, um, in 2021, I think we put up something like 108 percent positive return. Um, we were down about 10 percent in 2022, which I think was fa fairly modest given the volatility we saw in, in every other market. And our outlook is that this this market will now, after the clarity that we've had on the policy side, will we'll, we'll start to grow again. So this is something that has this asymmetry that I think is constructive to the upside. It's something that doesn't correlate with anything else that you have in your portfolio. And the reason that that exists is there'll, of course, be some correlation to energy prices at times. There'll be some correlation to the economic cycle at times. So you know, booming economy, more economic activity, more pollution, recession, less activity, less pollution. There's some tail and headwinds there, but moreover, they're going to correlate to the tightening cycle. And that is what is not correlated to any other asset that's in, in your portfolio. And in fact, if you believe that commodities over time is a great diversifier, but there's some mean reversion, is there an expected positive return over long periods of time? There is for sure in carbon allowances, an expectation that supply will fall dramatically and therefore there'll be this squeeze, if you like, um, for prices to move higher as they as they uh, as they work through this policy. So really interesting to look at. And then I should note that we also have a European fund only and a California only fund for investors that want those positions. We we have a lot of investors that are incredibly bullish California because California trades about thirty dollars right now. And there's views that this should be at fifty five, sixty five. Europe is already trading about 90 euros uh, and views that this should be 120. So maybe more upside to California, but I would argue really strongly that you want to be in both of these markets because while you're waiting for that big move that may come in California, we don't know when that will come. Whereas 
Europe could very easily put up a 20% return uh, this year, 30% return that may be repeatable for several years in a row. So I, I think um, the way the way we think clients should be positioned is 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 in the sort of global portfolio that we manage in, in KRBN. But by all means, overweight yourself to California by using the California fund to sort of tilt further towards California if you have that strong view. Uh, Luke, you mentioned at uh, the start of this conversation, that room where you'd have uh, half the people that uh, think that this is uh, interesting or a good idea, and then the other half that um, are kind of worried about uh, the government uh, setting this up. Given, you know, uh, given the political winds right now, uh, given that the ESG has kind of gone through uh, dips as well, is there any concern on the regulatory? Is there any concern on policy that uh, these markets wouldn't be supported? Well, that is what last year gave us a great test for that. If these markets were going to falter at the first challenge, and not even the first challenge, a very serious challenge, we had huge inflation in the US, we had huge energy prices in the US, and that would have been the prime opportunity for political pressure to say, why are we adding friction into our energy uh, industry? In fact, why are we adding cost anywhere in the supply chain when we have inflation? And cool heads prevailed that what one, the price of carbon is a tiny part of the inflation we've seen, if it's if it's a factor at all. Um, Europe, it was maybe 5% of the increase that people saw to energy prices in Europe, which was more extreme than it was in the US. But these markets survived 2022. And I think that was, uh, and not that I had any doubts they'd survive, but it was a really clear message that both California's program got tighter. We saw North Carolina, make moves to enter the Northeast program, which, uh, and then for full disclosure, you know, Virginia maybe wants out, Pennsylvania, which will be a huge addition to that market once in, and now North Carolina wants out. So in the net, two, one wants out, two want in, very positive, I think. And so I think the political risk is really mitigated. I don't think that's the big risk here anymore. And it used to be one I talked about a lot. I think I'm very comfortable that it, that it isn't anymore. If you were to say to me, so what is the risk? I think the risk is that uh, we might the program might be too successful in that the price rises enough that we create this massive wave of innovation that reduces pollution. And now if that happens, we get a win for the for the for the environment and the win for the impact investors. But it might create volatility in the market. Now, when you talk about that room, half the room, and I, I would put myself in this half, I would be okay with volatility if my impact investment is driving huge impact. If I was only in it for return, I would think about it slightly differently, but I would still be quite comfortable because I would say, well, I'm gonna get volatility because climate change is getting solved by the price of carbon. Let's say carbon at 120 creates this huge uh, drop in pollution. Well, then that will cause the carbon price to drop below 120. So if I was the carbon regulator by the European Union or the European Commission, California Air Resource Board, I would say at 120, we were changing the world and solving climate change. Now we're back to 100. We need to get it back to 120. The, the demand curve is shifted materially. So we now need to shift the supply curve. So they would put new policy in to tighten back up, just like I said, like the central bank type function. So when you get volatility because of innovation, I think the program then adjusts. And so you stay the course, the program adjusts, and it brings that equilibrium price back somewhere close to where it was. So this kind of speaks to this um, asymmetry that the the things that can hurt you on the downside will actually lead to policy supporting you um, back up. Now, I shouldn't suggest that this this only goes one direction. You can see very clearly if you look at look at a chart for, for these ETFs, there's some volatility there, and it's about twice as volatile as U.S. equity. So I mentioned low low correlation double the volatility. In a portfolio though, because of that correlation benefit, it is dampening to portfolio vol volatility. But I, I don't want to mislead anyone that this is uh, this is a low risk, only can go up investment would, would be, would be uh, you know, uh, certainly not language I, I, I'm allowed to say, but certainly this is a risky investment. It's volatile, but I believe that political risk is quite low and that it is structurally engineered to move higher to, to reduce uh, pollution. So if you believe there's gonna be more regulation on pollution, this is an investment that, uh, that, that gives you a very pure reflection of that, of, that, uh, of, of that thesis. Luke, thanks for explaining the carbon markets to us. 
Thank you. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to. He's Luke Oliver. He's Managing Director of Climate at Crane Shares. My name is Michael McRae and you're watching Kiko Mining. <laughs>